Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, MPF webinar series, our 20, what, 25th, 26th installment, URI, since, uh, since it all began uh, when COVID hit us. How are you doing, my friend? I am doing well, John. How are you? It seems, is it already 20? It, it seems so few. Oh, we are it's well funny. into the mid 20s, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, it seems a while since we've done our last one, though. You yeah. know, yes, just yes. seems like it's been a while. Yes, and um, good to see you, and so delighted to have as our guest speaker today Don Morazic. And Don is a longtime chair of Hinshaw Culbertson, a Chicago based firm that grew like wildfire under his watch. And uh, he stepped out of the chairman's role a few years back. Uh, so we're delighted, Don, to have you with us to share your perspectives. Uh, your guidance to managing partners, law firm leaders on today's call. Well, thanks, John. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's a new format for me, so I'm excited about participating and uh, hopefully sharing a good thought or two along the way. Well, we uh, we promise it will be fun and lively, and you'll look back in an hour and uh, five minutes from now going, whoo, the time really does fly by. And, uh, you know, we're big at getting the feedback from our participants in terms of the topics and the format and all that good stuff. So uh, we got a good crowd with us today. We had 115 register and typically about 75, 80 percent of that number actually show up. So uh, good, good, uh, good crowd. We're delighted to, to those of you who uh, are joining us for an hour of your day this afternoon. Welcome. Uri, what uh, advice do you have for Don, maybe for our listeners uh, today's, today's session? Ooh, well, we, I think we've decided today to focus on a very small, itsy bitsy, witsy, little tiny issue for law firms, John, haven't we? Just succession. Don't get all technical with terms like itsy bitsy. <laughs> I was trying to make a joke. I should have practiced that one, John. <laughs> I mean, this is a big topic. I, I, I was joking, but th this is a big topic. And, and obviously, we're going to cover just scratch the surface uh, with today's webinar. But uh, look, it's it's a hot topic. You know, yeah, you know what question maybe we needed to ask, John, the average uh, tenure at the firms, you know, how aged, how important is succession, you think, at these firms? Um, you know, good question. We've asked questions in and around the managing partner role. How long yeah. have you been in the role? Are you yeah. term limited? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is it an election versus kind of consensus building? You know, succession covers so many things from investing yep. in young people to helping our seniors along when transitioning their, their clients and, and their uh, expertise. Uh, it speaks to the founding partner and what your exit strategy might be. And at the end of this session, Don's going to speak to that, you know, to the managing partner, often the founding partner. Yep. or the, the, the equity partner with substantial interest in the firm and, and looking at the options. How do we value it? Uh, what, how do we transition it? What are the options? Um, and then how do we affect a good, smooth, deliberate uh, exit strategy as, as founders, principal, principal, you know. No question, there's, there's lots of nuances to the, to the uh, subject and uh, you've covered a lot of them there, John. Uh, but they are, they are all related. Uh, I would throw in a couple of others. Uh, again, you can't separate it from the, the nuances you've discussed, but or at least mentioned. But uh, client succession. Uh, what are we doing to, to preserve client succession? And last but not least, what do we do in the event of death or disability? Do we have that covered? That's particularly important for smaller firms, but uh, important for all of us as lawyers so there's just a just a ton of things to talk about and we'll there. as you say we'll scratch that surface today and be ready to delve yeah, into we'll, this is an introduction later. to succession planning so we're going to go shallow probably on a lot of aspects of this and we're going to be doing a fall symposium next <laughs> month where we're going to drill down a little bit more 
uh, on this important topic. So I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking it's time to, to it's two o'clock on the hour and our crowd is assembling. So why don't we go ahead and jump in gentlemen and delighted to everyone. Welcome to uh, the MPF webinar series and this month's topic, which is an introduction to law firm succession planning, something that should be woven throughout your firm all the time. Uh, will be woven into its culture, I think our panel will 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 suggest. Uh, we're going to, you know, present lots of polling data as we frequently do, and uh, hopefully give you all some good concrete action items to think about to act on coming out of today's call. Uh, so off we go. Um, Uri Gutfreund, those of you who've attended any of these sessions know Uri. Uh, Uri, good to see you as always. Thanks, John. Great to be here. Looking forward. As am I, and uh, glad you're here. I run the managing partner forum for about 20 some years, and normally we do a lot of in person meetings, but you know, we're trying here to do the best, next best thing uh, with these webinars and virtual conferences. Uh, hopefully, next year we'll be back in the groove and meeting in person, uh, breaking bread, learning with and from each other. Don Morozik is our guest speaker. Don, so great to see you. Great to see you, John, and thank you for uh, including me, Yuri, John, both of you. Thank you. Well, our pleasure to have you. Thank you for the time you've put to this and for your participation today and in this fall symposium. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Don was the chair for 27 years at Hinshaw and Culbertson. Uh, grew it from a Chicago-based single office firm to a national player. Uh, now 400 plus lawyers across 25 offices. Hard to keep keep track, I'm sure, Don. <laughs> um, but but as you've given up the chairmanship of your law firm, you now chair this uh, this consultant and coaches to the professions practice group. Tell me about that. Well, it, it's a combination of old fashioned lawyering in in terms of some aspects of it. That is to say, you know, we we do partnership agreements, particularly with uh, merged firms that want a uh, a new look at at, at uh, in an agreement. We work a lot with uh, compensation systems, work with managing partners on comp systems. Uh, we work with them as business consultants as well as lawyers when it comes to those combinations and mergers. Uh, the current hot topic is, uh, not surprisingly, what you've identified, a lot of succession planning and all of the various nuances we've been discussing. Uh, the coaching thing is is really an interesting thing, and uh, it's it's it it started with uh, me as my as my uh, tenure at Hinshaw's chairman grew longer and longer. I found myself getting more and more insular. I was getting lots of advice from lots of people, grooming people, but we were uh, all kind of thought alike. That's the advantage of a good culture, but it can be a disadvantage. And I often sought out anybody to talk to. That I, whose uh, opinions I respected, who might give me some advice or just listen or talk about family, whatever. Uh, similar to what a lot of the, in the business world, executive coaching it's called. So it's a, it's a pretty broad based uh, law firm, business firm, consulting practice with a little bit of coaching thrown in. Interesting. Thank, thanks for asking. Glad to. Uh, you know, we hear glad to have the from, chance from, for the commercial. <laughs> from managing partners, how lonely it is at the top. You know, no one to talk to, no one to relate to. Uh, so yeah, to have that resource and that, that's something we try to deliver. You know, as part of what we do, that community to help yeah. managing partners be more effective in a, in a very important but but often ill-defined role. Um, we do these webinars. Usually we hone in on the first Wednesday of uh, the month this week with the change in dates and uh, on our fall symposium, we had to cancel it and we just got a little discombobulated. So here we come to you on the second Wednesday, but we'll be back in the saddle December 1st. Um, we're going to be doing a fall symposium, November 3. You'll hear more about it. Registration's open, so we encourage you to check that out if you're interested in learning more about succession. Uh, Don, you're on the program, and uh, along with Ida Abbott, have been helping me concoct our agenda and recruit speakers. Yeah, uh, Jim, let me just chime in here. Uh, number one, I'm, I'm pleased to be part of the uh, faculty. Uh, this is really a robust group. 
with with plenty of knowledge. You've really done a great job of putting together some some really top notch people, people that really have something to uh, to say of, of value to the audience. So congratulations and and thank you. I'm looking forward to it. It should be a really interesting program. Originally, we were going to do this over a full day in Chicago and uh, got nervous with the with the you know variant covid and decided now it's best to suspend it and try to recreate a virtual program so that's what we're coming back to you with and and our faculty is is in place which is great uh, and we've condensed it you know into an online format but uh, check us out you'll learn more about it in the follow-up and you know we'll reference it a little bit don thank you for being a part of it uri you're on our faculty as well um, and Uri's going to be talking about risk management aspects, risk around succession, you know, um, and there's a lot to that when you think about it. Uh, today we have 115 firm leaders, and we're going to talk about an introduction to succession. Get you thinking about a lot of things. We got our polling questions. We're going to ask Don to reflect at the end uh, of our time and uh, speak to us for, uh, from his perspective. Uh, as a managing partner, we love retired managing partners on our programs because they tend to tell it like it is, and they've been there, done that, so they speak with authority and credibility um, And our next webinar, December 1. Here's some data. I'm just going to, folks love the data, so I, I just want to queue up some data uh, that we often incorporated into different programs we do, and, and we've seen this out there for a while. This is collected by the ABA and the Canadian Bar and speaks to the amount of business originated by, generated by senior lawyers within US and Canadian law firms. And you know that should make you a little nervous about transition of client relationships and succession. At our conference, we from time to time ask this question, and this comes from one of our more recent live programs in Atlanta, 120 managing partners weighing in. How you doing on this? generally and nobody's given themselves a 10 and we see quite a few firms coming in at four or less who might should be you know this is something y'all should work on talk about put some initiatives in place uh so that we don't screw it up we got a good thing going here and we don't screw it up for lack of planning and, and lack of transition we just expect it will always be um so John, with that data on that, you know i i actually think those numbers are understated uh hmm. meaning I, I i think a lot of people are overgrading themselves what uh, what i see lawyers doing a lot is postponing and uh maybe starting and stopping and starting and stopping so i think it's more serious than this graph indicates i think uh we have a, t a tendency in this area, at least, to give ourselves better grades than we really, really have. Well, I agree with you, Don. Why do you think this is so often postponed? Uh, it's a for for some, it's an unpleasant topic. Like yeah. you know, the the present is 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 going just fine. Why do I want to think about uh, future problems? Uh, for others, it's. Uh, I know it's important, but damn, I've got so many things on my plate, yeah. you know, and uh, I, I just can't get to it. And for some, it's daunting. Like, okay, I'm doing, I've got the client base. I, I'm, I'm managing the firm on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I, I'm active in the community. Uh, I've got to get somebody else to lead this this process. So it's a combination. I'm sure there are other reasons, but those are some I, I think of. You know, I work with a lot of first generation firms and they often spin out a big law, you know, three or four younger lawyers dissatisfied with the status quo, go start a firm. And they, they've got a bond and a vision among them and they grow the place and they haven't thought about this stuff. They're too busy, you know, practicing law, making money. It's all great as long as those founders are, are in play and of sound body and mind. But often they wake up at 67 years old and go, wow, what happened? And um, so. Yep, I, I'm, I'm experiencing that with a client right now. Got a couple of spinoffs from a uh, couple of guys who spun off from a mega firm. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, they are just killing it, <laughs> which is mm -hmm. which is good news. Uh, but trying to get them refocused on what we said we were going to do when we <laughs> set them up is, is another yes. thing. And I get it. I get it. It's yeah, you're a victim of your own busy. success. They're almost, busy. You know, they're busy and they're as you say, counting the money and having fun. So anyway, Murray, are you seeing uh, what 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 say you about these just general? you know statistics about the profession and law firms how they're handling i you know i i see the postponement in two like don said it's the it's a it's a conversation that is sort of in the same category of talking about death and estate planning you know yeah i'll get so to it when i want to get to talk it. about the estate plan yeah exactly <laughs> exactly exactly and it's not urgent it's not urgent if i don't do it today tomorrow's going to be just fine until, as Don said, or or you may have said, somebody somebody has a heart attack, or yeah. somebody gets hit by a bus, and then you know we haven't done anything to plan around this. I, I dealt that with that one too. This Don mostly for you as our guest speaker, and people love the polling. So uh, this is our traditional open polling question that I will put out there for everybody. And if you would vote early, vote often. We have now on today's call 75 people, including our faculty, which is right where we thought we'd be. So uh, in terms of firm size, about two thirds of you are in right now. And Don, we tend to get a smattering, uh, you know, topic drives it a little bit. But let me go ahead. We've got 80% voting and share this. Uh, we tend to have mm -hmm. today um, some a good chunk of big firms, 100 or more lawyers, about a fourth of per day's, uh, today's participants. So thank you for voting, everybody. And um, some more data. Uri, let me hand over to you here uh, to cover what sure. people shared with us when they registered. Yeah, so when we you registered, there were several questions. I believe we have three on tap for today. Our first question when you registered was, what percentage of your firm's revenue is generated by your old lawyers that are a little older, 60 plus years old? So 13% of you said more than 75%. 27%, just about a quarter, is just over that 50 line. 22%. And that 25 to 49% and less than 25%, 27 and not sure at nine. So about 40% gentlemen, 40% more than 50%. Don, does that surprise you? Uh, it doesn't surprise me, but I think it points to uh, the reason for this seminar and this this webcast i mean 40 percent uh is a huge number really when you think about it and to have even 13 percent with uh mm. well, 60 years and older uh that's that's to me proof in the pudding that should be How scary you, john i i How think that you, should be scary and and you know what this is not as uh skewed right. towards senior lawyers as the previous data we shared that that mm -hmm. data originating from the aba and canadian bar you know this is our subset today and it looks like generally firms on today's call seem to be a little more tuned into this topic uh than that that aba canadian bar that's kind of why what i take out of it um, again, I think succession should live and breathe all the time. And we're integrating young lawyers into our client relationships. Uh, it's just part of our DNA. We have client teams. We have industry practice groups. We have a compensation system that encourages sharing and, and transition of relationships as opposed to the hoarding and control uh, that is frequently, uh, you know, Don, you and I were talking about origination credit and how challenging is a managing partner dealing with shared origination and you know that took a I lot of your time didn't it one of the one of the toughest issues out there as far as i was concerned and still am concerned because there's there's really not one size that fits all it's uh, so dependent on the size of the client how long they've been a client uh how many different practice groups are involved and so on and so forth so yes it is it is uh an issue that uh, 
evades perfection solutions, but uh, one that we all work at to do the best we can for our partners and ourselves. It's a tough one. Yeah, and those people who aren't sure one. should get sure, I think. <laughs> yeah. you know, this that is, is an interesting question. I'm assuming the managing partners answer that question without checking their CFO. They, they, they should know <laughs> the answer in their firm somewhere. Tune oh. into it. Tune into this. It can be very, very revealing uh, when you John, do this analysis. Our next question, when you registered, we asked if you have a clearly articulated, and, and we have a specific word there, clearly articulated succession plan in place. So how many of you had clearly articulated succession plans? Uh, a mere 12% said yes, you have One a clearly eight. articulated 12%. Congratulations, congratulations to the 12 percenters. Great news. <laughs> Absolutely. 40% no. 46% work in progress, which means to me, not no. yet. <laughs> or no. I think it John, means, you can't be clearly articulated no, if it's a work in progress. No, about well, you know, it, this is a, a very intentionally ambiguous question, you know, <laughs> uh, but the idea, yeah. does your firm have some sort of strategy and mm -hmm. succession plan in place institutionally? Um, and one in, one in eight say, yeah, we got it which, you know, it speaks to a vision and running the firm as a business and a strategic plan and, and looking forward at where we're going um, and investing in our business as a, a, an ongoing, you know, sustainable entity. Don, uh, does it Don, surprise you that more firms don't have a firm-wide yeah. kind of approach to succession planning? Does it surprise me? No. Yeah. No, it doesn't surprise me, but it it is uh, not... Good, not good. By the way, on the 12% of you who I congratulate for uh, having such a plan, uh, the one uh, bit of advice I throw out there is make sure you update it from time to time and and, and follow it. It's one thing mm -hmm. to, to uh, write the plan, then you've got to execute the plan. And sometimes the execution uh, is ongoing in part, but also has a longer term component. So revisit it, make sure it's the way you want it to go. And, and remember to have some sense of contingency in the event, gee, this looks great and uh, managing partner leaves, retires off playing golf somewhere, or maybe boating or playing bridge. Uh, and the one that we thought would be a great new person to take over, he or she looked great, you know, hit a hit a thousand in the minor leagues, got up to the majors, and just didn't do the job. Be, be pre prepared for those sorts of contingencies. It doesn't always work out, so your plan has to address that as well. And John, Early, it has to be shared. You do a lot of work with New York, New Jersey firms, and I always mm -hmm. think that they're a little ahead of the rest of us. No. Uh, why I house that notion, I don't know. But uh, what are you seeing up there among the firms with whom you work most closely in terms of firm-wide succession? Struggling. I mean, this statistic is probably pretty accurate, to your point, even in New York. Um, it, it's a tough business uh, for the reasons we talked about earlier. You have to come to grips of looking around the team, you know, projecting who's going to be the team leader in the future. It's a hard business. Um, it's consensus, somebody not might not like, and you know how risk averse lawyers are. If I put a plan together, let's say some of my partners don't like the plan, what are we gonna do then? So not not ahead, that's for sure. And Uri, this was our last uh, when people registered question. Yeah, and this is this is a question really that was not about your firm, but about you. Are you grooming your successor to assume your managing partner leadership role? So almost 20% of you have identified and are grooming. That's that's pretty impressive. Nice um, number. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, maybe we have to delve down a little deeper. If you've identified, have you told anybody? Have you told them? I'm not sure. <laughs> that's the identified, but I'm not yet grooming. It's a secret. Right, identified, <laughs> not yet grooming. So I've chosen that just, person, but... Uh, but they don't you know, know a lot what of yet. Folks, you know, 24%. I have plenty of time, plenty of time. Mm -hmm. And you know right. what? The, the years fly by. 
Yes. And, yes. and before you know it, here you stand at 65 and you haven't groomed your successor or um, it's a little late to start. Um, John, John? We, 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 well, we've seen this trend of um, managing partner elect being around and abound. Don and John, what say you? Is that a good way of appointing almost in advance, grooming? Don, what do you say for that? Well, you have to know what that means exactly. I mean, maybe okay. I'm, I'm answering the question with a question. What is what does mm -hmm. uh, managing partner elect or chairman elect really mean? Uh, if it means that you're, there's actually a turnover of responsibility uh, happening, then that's a very good thing. If it's okay. just some sort of title with, mm. uh, with the understanding that when I finally decide to go, uh, this person will take over, then I don't think it's uh, nearly as, as effective. Um, I don't know, should I tell my story about uh, Paul Hastings article today? Interesting. <laughs> John, we tell us your story. All right, yeah. So there was a little article in Law 360 today that <laughs> that, that kind of uh, addresses this in, in in the real world. Admittedly, with a mega firm, Paul Hastings. I'm stealing the uh, article from from uh, uh, Law 360. They have a chairman who's going, been chairman for 20 plus years, much like I was. He is now going to retire next year, one year from now. So it's a one year window. Uh, during his tenure, there were co-managing partners, mm. too. but again, only one at the top. Yeah. They are retiring today or shortly, and two new managing partners will take over, one of whom will, always, will also share the title, this is what brought it to mind, of uh, chairman-elect. So I think in, 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 in that parlance, that chairman is is going to be definitely getting groomed uh, for the job and will be as, assuming responsibilities. Uh, so it's out there in a, a very successful large firm, but still in all, draw a distinction, managing partners are quote unquote kind of number twos, executive vice presidents running a business unit maybe, uh, whereas there's only one man at the top, one woman at the top, uh, one chair, and I think that's the way it should be. By the way, not that you asked. <laughs> we like strong opinions at the managing partner forum. Yeah, to, to, to me, uh, co-equal managers is just just my experience. Uh, there can only be one maybe, president at any time, Don. You believe in that, yeah, don't you? If you really had it, mean you have zero. If you have mm -hmm. two at the top, means you have zero at the top, in my yeah. view. Well, you know, I, I, it's well, I the exception. I mean, I mean, less than five percent do I kind of run into that co-managing partner, and often one's externally focused, more strategic, business development, marketing face of the firm. One's more internally focused on operations and finance and and maybe technology. Uh, I liken it to the mater D in the front of the house. You need a good chef in the back of the house. Together, we can pull off a good product. And we kind of need each other, but but you don't see it often. I think the roles have to be clearly described if we're going to go to a co-model, you know, because uh, there's overlap and gray lines there. I think Don, the best uh, gift an outgoing managing partner or any law firm leader can leave his or her successor is a job description mm -hmm. that sets forth what's involved in the role, in terms of the time, the authorities the responsibilities. So often these young folks don't know what they're getting into and don't appreciate the amount of time and dedication it takes to be a good group leader, a good managing partner and leaving a job description. We find about 40% of managing partners have such an animal and we're str a strong proponent. Um, I'm looking at the clock here, uh, Uri, and we got a couple polling questions and then yep. we want we want to hear from Don. Uh, make sure we hold some time out at the end. So here's the second polling question. Here again, get out your uh, voting instruments. And uh, being in Georgia, I like to kid that we know how to count ballots. Uh, we had some good practice with that the past two years. Um, how is your firm doing, generally speaking, at identifying, grooming its future leaders? That's a very broad question. Would you give your firm high marks 
or not so high marks when it comes to identifying and grooming those future leaders carrying us into the future. Don, I'm gonna ask for your prediction. What do you think our crowd today is gonna to come in with? Uh, heavily, in term heavily fair, heavy heavily numbers are fair. Heavily fair. Uri, you do a lot of all audience polling. Uh, your prediction on this one, please. Oh, very good, very good. And folks, if you haven't voted, get in there. Polls are closing, polls are closing. And uh, here's the results. And Don, you were spot Ooh. on, mm. heavily fair. And he didn't cheat everybody. Um, <laughs> clear room for improvement. Uh, identify and groom those future marketers, those future practice group leaders. Um, I think that's a good initiative. Don, what say you from experience at a firm like Henshaw on identifying and grooming future leaders? Uh, fair, <laughs> fair. We thought we were doing a better job than uh, I think objective statistics would prove. And in and, and, and a larger firm, it's important to remember, it's not just, you, you did use the word leaders, that's very important because it's not just the top person that needs to have a groomed successor. It's 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 uh, many of the uh, people who are very uh, successful in the firm. So we did very well with some and uh, okay with others in an occasional uh, dropped ball, so to speak. So I, I, I overall give us fair, maybe maybe a little leaning towards good. John, um, in a, John, in a mid mid sized and smaller firm. John, where do you see the testing grounds for leadership at a firm? So what, what, what advice would you give, John? What kinds of roles would you focus on? To the, to, the lead, to the existing leadership, to the managing partner? I say create those opportunities for your young lawyers to step into leadership. Uh, you encourage them to get out and involved in the community. Uh, do Leadership New York. Uh, it's just an expectation we have of young lawyers early on. Um, we ask them to chair committees, task forces. Perhaps we have a young lawyer on our executive committee, uh, but engage young folks and uh, you can see who rises to the top, I think, if you create these opportunities. There's more to it than just billable hours. Um, you know, and, and Don, I was gonna ask you from where you sit high in that perch as chair, how do you spot leadership what do you look for how does it manifest itself to you well it, it generally becomes evident that someone is good at what they do it's good they're good at consensus building they're good at client relationships uh they're good at getting a job done and there's usually a, a number of candidates uh in a firm and you know you've got to try to give them the opportunity as you describe it uh, i i try to simplify it into three easy things that that you should do uh when grooming and i'm simplifying but it's easy to remember number one you've got to give them authority to accomplish a task you can't just have them be your second and uh, follow you around all day they have to have some authority where they can show and exhibit how they handle situations. Two, uh, implicit in what I just said, they have to have visibility. You can't give them a job, uh, uh, see them do a good job and like take credit for it yourself. They have to have the visibility that they have this authority. And third, and implicit in one and two, they have to have recognition. Now, a pat on the back, job well done, that's part of recognition, but frankly, with lawyers, money counts. So I would say, keep in mind, grant authority, delegate, in other words, another, another word for it, uh, visible, give them visibility, and third, recognition, both, both the pats on the back and the uh, monetary reward. Don, have you all ever used psychological assessments? to identify leadership, business development, uh, mentoring skill sets among your lawyers? We have not 
nor have any of the clients that I've been working with. And there's quite a number of them over the last couple of years. I, I don't find that common, uh, but I think it could be valuable. Uh, if I think the word psychological maybe scares off lawyers, like, wait a minute, are you going to, you know, uh, is this sort some sort of a lie detector test, or you know, you're going to tell me all the things I'm I'm doing wrong? How um, crazy you are! Maybe, maybe, maybe we should find a, find a better way to uh, describe it than psychological assessment. But the idea of bringing in uh, and on in the business world, you have these corn fairy is, is one of the big mm -hmm. concerns that does this sort of work. Somebody who who does a uh, an interview and and uh, comments upon the readiness of the person for the job and what they can do to improve. Uh, in other words, I I would probably not use that phrase uh, if I was trying to convince a client to to go okay. forward with something. You know, Larry Richard, our psychologist friend, uh, is a proponent of these and how helpful they can be to hire the right people, to compatible with your culture, all this good stuff. I was just with a client uh, that, uh, yeah, actually in person with them, and they had all gone through DISC profiles mm -hmm. and found it very helpful to appreciate one another's personalities and such. And I'm a D, I'm an I. Oh, now I can appreciate why, you know, they're, they're, this one, you know, I have trouble relating to because she's an I. Well, now I can appreciate it a bit more. And they found it very helpful to, uh, you know, their, their group dynamics and, and all, that, all that good stuff. Uh, but, you know, investing in those young people, giving them the opportunities. Here's another polling question, and this speaks to the flip side and, you know, investing in your young folks, but as well, helping your seniors along uh, when it's time. And uh, how this is a blunt question. Do you have any mandatory de-equitization provisions uh, in your partnership agreement when it comes to senior lawyers? And your choices on this are yes, no, or work in progress. And Don, as people are voting, I will ask you, do you think most of the folks on today's call have these sorts of provisions? And then my part two to that is generally, how do you feel about such provisions within partnership agreements? I would say the answer is no, with uh, work in progress being checked often, but to me, that's that means no, right? It's not yep. there yet. It's, um, it's not in place, correct. And my my own feeling about it is, um, the positive is is it does keep your opportunities for the younger folks uh, out there. And that's important in many firms. You, we're all involved in talent drains these days uh, and huge markets for, for lawyers. Uh, nice to be able to say that right now, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and I think it's, it's, um, it's a better alternative than forced retirement. Let me put it that way. I think it gives more uh, flexibility to both the lawyer, old, I'll call them older, uh, there's probably a better word, more experienced. Senior, senior's more, a good more, word. More, more experienced, yeah, senior, <laughs> uh, and also to the firm. So I'm not opposed to them. I think they're preferable to forced retirement. Um, I think the, uh, devil's in the, the uh, devil's in the detail. You surprised that one in five uh, firms on today's call have such provisions within their agreements? Yeah, a little bit. I am I too. I think that's I high. I would have predicted a lower number. I would so. too. And we're talking about equitization, not employment. Right. Um, and, not, and not necessarily compensation. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, right. You know, it's it's you know it's something to leave behind. If you're a group of founding partners and you don't yet have this provision, you're still a first generation law firm. You know, this is something you might you know the first of you out set the precedent uh, in terms of how a senior partner is expected to transition to life beyond law. And is it an expectation we have? Um, you know, we're going to hear at our fall symposium, Florida has something called the inventory lawyer concept, the Florida bar. 
Uh, New York has something similar as well, where there's backup for senior lawyers. You know, Florida, you got a lawyer, a lot of lawyers in their 80s and 90s uh, that still think they're on top of their games, and, and they may or may not be. But uh, helping seniors out when uh, when the time is there, you know, it's a it's a touchy one. It's a touchy one. Um, retiring partners. Uh, <laughs> um, Don, what advice would you give firm leaders if they've got lawyers or staff members who are working beyond their 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 time they should be working? Uh, perhaps you're starting to see some lapse in judgment, and uh, you know they're, they're, they they may become a liability. Uh, how how do you we sit all down and have that conversation? It's uh, it's difficult, but it must be done, and you must uh, move them on. It's especially difficult because often the family gets involved, and good relationships you've had with family members are suddenly strained. You'll, you'll probably need family members to help you, uh, but you've got to protect uh, your firm and yourself, and you have to let these personal relationships um, go where they will go. I mean, you're doing the best thing for them and for for your firm, but but they are they are difficult. Uh, I have found in the more serious situations, the family does come around. Uh, so if that's any comfort to you as you, uh, that first conversation is just a bear. Uh, but as as you move forward, they begin to see things that you often see it before they do for whatever reason. So I think you have to, to move them out. There's, there's Document, 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 I yeah. think. When you yeah. have your conversations, when there are reports of, uh, you know, issues, document, document. Yeah, and make, uh, make, sure, make sure you know somebody, uh, you are involving uh, someone who has an employment law background who understands uh, what exact documents you need to have, how you need to handle the entire situation. Hopefully that person's in your firm, you don't have to go outside, uh, but if you have to go outside, do it, it's worth it. It's worth it. Uri, you must see some of this in your risk management work with law firms, seniors that, you know. I do. I do. You know, maybe it's in addition with COVID. I see people sometimes saying, you know, meaning on the receiving end of that conversation where they say to the managing partner or, or frankly, whoever is uh, designated to have that first tough conversation, something to the extent of relief. And I'm so glad you brought it up because I've been meaning. So it sort of helps people. Some people are relieved to have that conversation. They are. Uh, either they know it themselves it's coming or they, they sort of have that sense and, and they're happy to have that, you know, clear the air, set the expectations. So I think sometimes it's surprising how welcoming that conversation can be. And I think she want people to be remembered at the top of their game. And, yes. um, and, and I want to help you preserve your legacy. Yep. preserve your reputation and exit gracefully. And um, Don, you were talking about psychological rewards there. You know, that party, that Rolex watch, that portrait in the in the reception area, uh, those naming rights on the firm going forward might be, you know, pretty motivating uh, to, to re retiring lawyers. Yeah, uh, back to Uri's uh, point for a minute. I have not had the experience either as a consultant or in my own firm with uh, the sense of relief you discussed with a with a medical issue. But I have had that result when someone's practice was just not there anymore, mm -hmm. and they were struggling. Right. They were struggling. They were, you know finding it hard to keep up, that it was impacting their uh, self of sen their sense of self-worth. And when you finally tell them, look, we think it's time for you to retire, um, after the initial reaction, you find uh, a relief. And almost, uh, is, it may go as far as an actual thank you. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I find I, I agree with you, Don. I see all you know that occasionally when we're dealing with a situation involving chronic underperformance, and it's yep. really become a chronic situation. And this person wants an exit ramp, but it's just not there. And 
you know, helping provide that exit ramp or, you know, that coaching, that plan to step back up if I want to get my practice, you know, back rolling. Uh, but ha sitting down and having that conversation, a lot of it's ego, as you know. Uh, here's a question, and I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit, Don, to give you your uh, time at the end, uh, involving unfunded retirement obligations to retire retired partners. Uh, that traps firms from time to time um, in, in, in terms of the those unfunded retirement obligations. Is your firm dealing with those to any degree? And as people are voting, Don, uh, what's your prediction on the answer here? Hopefully no. <laughs> Hopefully no. You see we'll it as a problem today. for a lot of firms you you work with. Uh, not not as much as it was a generation ago, but it's yeah. it's, it's it's creeping back into the uh, scenario. So I'll I'll be interested to see if I'm right. I'm going to say no. No, being How overwhelmingly no, Don. I mean, uh, not not. I'll go. Uh, is this Jeopardy? Do I get? Do I get? Is this double Jeopardy or? Uh, let's. <laughs> I'll go forty. I wish there was big money in it for you, Don. But <laughs> not even a few bucks. I'll go forty-five percent. Forty-five percent, Uri. What do you see in here? Are you see in much in the way of unfunded retirement obligations? I'm going to go over on that. It's going to be uh, fifty-five plus on the no. The big fat no. Look at that. Oh. There you go. <laughs> and I agree with you, Don. My observation is we see it less and less. I, I mean, there was, you know, the time you yeah. you'd see it frequently and it, it, it sh you know, it just, it, it drive the firm, you know, we, we got to reconstitute mm -hmm. this firm because uh, right. we owe too much money to people who aren't around. And how do you recruit laterals to that? <laughs> <laughs> Not easy. Well, how I do you recruit future equity partners to that, you know? Uh, yeah. Couple of couple of quick comments on this. Uh, one personal, when I uh, was first recruited at Hinshaw back in the days when uh, Ford was still around, um, that was a huge selling point. Hinshaw did not have unfunded liabilities, and almost every other firm on the street did. They 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 were parroted accounting firms, CPA firms, which still in many case, more cases still do have the unfunded obligations. And slowly but surely over the years, uh, I, just when I was chairman, we we refused to go forward with a couple of uh, small acquisitions because we just didn't want them. And I think, I think they almost disappeared from the landscape, uh, but now they're starting to creep back in in part as part of this whole succession planning concept. Uh, so be careful. It's all out. Well, and, and, you know, in those first generation firms where the founders want to take care of themselves, you know, when, when they yeah. decide they want to leave and, and they build in that cushion. And, I get and it. they can work, uh, especially for the first generation person, but the more people involved, and clearly once you get to the second generation, maybe they've worked somewhere. I never saw one that did. I saw yeah. them pay off, pay off to the founder, a founder, maybe even a couple of founders. But often the agreements provided these buyouts for everyone. And by the time you got down past the that 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 initial generation, it was just you know, lawyers had other places to go with their business than to uh, uh, spend a lot of money uh, making sure that someone who's left is, is being taken care of. They were willing to do it for the founder. They weren't willing to do it for the next generation. So if you're, if you're going in that direction, I would take that as uh, good advice, frankly. Well, uh, folks, hopefully that gives you a little data. We've kind of kind of sniffed around different aspects of succession, and we promised to carve out for Don here um, a segment at the end uh, that speaks to the managing partners. And uh, Don, I'll just let you roll from here and uh, set us up and say what you want to say. Yeah, and please uh, interrupt me with any questions or comments. I don't know if we have a chat function kind of a situation here, but uh, there were some some questions earlier that, that might fit in. Yeah, I, I thought I'd talk a little bit about 
the exit strategy for uh, founders uh, or major owners of firms, not, not necessarily sole owners, but, but people with major practices uh, who are looking for different ways to, to exit and monetize as the word of, of choice these days, uh, their practice. Um, I think there's a, a process to this to follow. And it starts out, not surprisingly, with trying to get a thorough and objective uh, feel for what the value of the firm is. Uh, this is this is uh, a subject that will be gone into in greater detail at our uh, uh, seminar conference next month, and and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but the uh, there like the business world, things are developing. There's a revenue multiple that's often used uh, as as a price. Uh, there's a two point two five to one is the range that I most commonly see. Uh, there's an earnings multiple component that people can look at as a guide. That tends to be uh, even a bigger range, someplace between one and 2.5. And then there's, again, getting more sophisticated as we move along, a capitalized cash flow type analysis where you're looking at the, the free cash flow, which is basically, uh, in many instances, what you were earning as the senior that's 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 the shorthand for for the capitalized cash flow and then add it add to it what an investor would expect to to get for his investment uh my caveat here is be careful uh at the end of the day your practice is worth what someone's willing to pay for and in especially in internal sales if you're going to sell it to a group within the firm but even to a certain extent in uh merger type situations if if you are getting a, a kind of a, a a benefit uh the purchase price is going to be paid in part out of future earnings of the firm and so whoever's buying including the partners that are buying internally are going to look at that and and, and they're only going to be willing to put up so much capital from a bank or from their bank accounts. Uh, otherwise, they're going to be looking, they're looking at the earnings from the firm, the success of the firm to pay you. So you've got to take all of that in consideration and come up with an objective but fair value. Um, step two then, and this takes time, step two is to explore your, your options. Okay, I think the most common one, I'm, I'm doing three at the moment, is an internal sale. Uh, to, to uh, other lawyers within the firm. A lot of times they have been called partners, but really we're not equity in the true sense, in any sense of the word. They were really very highly paid uh, associates with the with the partner uh, tag. Uh, that that's 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 option one. Option two is to actually merge your firm with another firm, and as part of that, there would be some monetary consideration for you. Uh, I'll get to this in a minute. It could be both a buyout kind of price, but also an employment contract going forward. I'll mention that again later. Third is, uh, frankly, I've, I've not, I've, this, this rule has been out there for a long time, ABA model 1.17, which is selling your firm or practice. And uh, not actually done this one myself, but it's out there. Uh, and the, the three components are you have to sell your entire firm or your practice. You have to agree to a, a non-compete, kind of funny since uh, our general rules are that those are unenforceable, but apparently in this situation, the AB, ABA thinks they're just fine. And uh, last but not least, of course, the clients have to agree. I think we could have all figured out that part. And the most exciting one uh, is the newest one is selling to outside investors. Um, Utah and Arizona, uh, both of whom will be represented at the conference uh, by very well thought of leaders of the bar in those states. Uh, they're leading the way here, uh, allowing law firms to have non-lawyer equity ownership. And um, that's that's 
very interesting. I am, it is reported, and I say reported because I have not been able to verify this, even though I'm in one of the states where it's reported the bars are considering it, are California, Florida, and Illinois. So we'll 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 see how how that all works out. Um, another little little uh, takeaway here is uh, in S September eighth of this year, the ABA published an opinion that is very interesting here, and it said lawyers from states that did not allow investments in these uh, these things are called alternative business structures. If you want to know a a nice new phrase, alternative business structures, can do so even if they are from a state that did not allow them. In other words, I could go invest in a Utah law firm, even though my state currently doesn't allow for that. So that's an exciting new option that's out there. I don't know how realistic it is uh, in the short term, but we're all in it in part for the long term as well. Um, on that, stay tuned, everybody, because we did a webinar on this where we had two managing partners, one from a Utah firm, one from an Arizona firm, uh, one former president of the Arizona State Bar, and uh, the regulatory sandbox is another term we hear bantered around. And go check out the Utah's Center for Legal Innovation. This is run by the Utah Supreme Court. You can go there and see who's petitioned the Utah Supreme Court to set up an alternative business structure. You can see what was ultimately approved by the Supreme Court out there. This is happening. And my conversations with managing partners of some of the bigger firms in Salt Lake City are they're watching, they're watching, they're observing. Uh, boy, I'd want to get in on the ground floor, I would think. I, I tend to be a bit entrepreneurial, but it's going to be really interesting, folks, to see how this all plays out. And as Don mentions, California, Florida, Illinois, I mean, it's it's coming, I think, I think, and it's coming faster than you realize. All right, now you've explored your options, you've come up with what, what option you want to follow. The, the third part, of course, is to negotiate the transaction. Um, the price, we talked a little bit about valuation, uh, and there, there really turn, turns out generally to be two components to this. One is upfront price for, for you. Uh, secondly, often an employment contract uh, I have that both at one and three. And let me let me say why employment contract is important. And it goes back to, in part, the buyer is going to try to finance the sale in part through the earnings of the firm. So everyone's got an incentive here. The buyer wants you to do everything you can do to affect a positive transition. So they want you around for a while. You want this to work because part of your part of your price is being paid out of earnings. So it's a mutual it's a win -win. protective device, and it should be part of your, or at least heavily considered as part of your transaction. I'll I'll, I'll go back now to two payment terms and security. Now John has uh, mentioned early on in the seminar the importance of getting started on your uh, succession planning early. And I agree with that 100%. But now that you are selling, uh, the transition should be as short as you can make it, not as long. I think three to five years, I, I saw some models that took it out for 10 years. And I'm going like, come on, these young people 10 years from now, I mean, they might sign up today, but after year seven, when they're still paying out money, they're gonna start to say, you know, why don't we go down the street and hang our own shingle and 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 mm -hmm. forget about this? So, no matter what your relationship is with the with the buyer, whether they're your current partners or they're an outside firm, three to five years is plenty. That's plenty of time for client transition. That's plenty of time for you to get paid out. Last but not least, naming rights. John has had uh, uh, and Yuri probably too is what he hasn't mentioned it to me, but I'm sure he has the same experience. Some of the uh, retiring partners are very uh, 
interested in having their name remain with the firm. So that needs to be addressed and needs to be Early. an issue. But I must tell you, as I uh, told John and Yuri the other day, in fact, I have one case where it's just the opposite, where the uh, founder, one of three founders uh, selling the practice, does once he's done, once his employment contract is finished, he does not want his name any longer associated with the firm. He says they can use, they can shorten the official firm name to the current initials. Everyone will know who that is. I just don't want my name out there. So there is always, you know, the, the other side of the coin. Uh, document the deal and execute the transaction. If you're a, a strong corporate lawyer, uh, you can document the deal yourself. If you're not, get help. Simple as that. And I've got a laundry list of documents that we'll talk about some other time about what all ought to be included in, in the uh, transaction. And then just a, a, a few hints. I know we're getting right down to the end here. Um, the process will take time. The evaluation, uh, the consideration of options, the transaction. There's an old saying in the business world, uh, a deal has is, is only got a certain amount of time. It's the, the rhythm of the deal. I find out with, with that with lawyers, things take longer when they're dealing with, they just take longer. So give yourself plenty of time. Keep those payment and tenure terms shorter. Just talked about that. If you need it, get professional advice and assistance. Um, I was talking with uh, a Florida lawyer, actually, who's uh, taking care of something for me in Florida. And he was uh, said to me, he was joking about having left a, uh, a conference with a lot of lawyers. And he says, well, you know, lawyers are, they think they're the smartest people in the room. And, he, and then uh, pause and he says, and generally they are. Well, I think that <laughs> there's a little bit of truth to that. But if we're really as smart as we think we are, we should know what we don't know. Don't don't be afraid to reach out. It's, it's a very important decision. Uh, get, get assistance when you need it. And lastly, last point, this is uh, the, the mental piece of it. Um, you've been the boss. Being the boss creates a certain aura about you. When you step down, you're not the boss anymore. Also, you may be retiring. So there's two components of it. One is to prepare yourself for no longer, no longer being in charge. And the other part is make sure you've got something in mind to keep your brain sharp. Uh, you know, golf and fishing aren't going to do it. You, you need uh, some not-for-profit activity. Uh, I, I joked about bridge because I like to play bridge, at least counting cards and so on and so forth. So the mental part, which Ida Abbott, one of our pan one of our panelists at the conference, will talk about, very important. Yeah. And I'm out of time. Two minutes early. How about that? <laughs> Don, <laughs> thank you. And you know, Larry Richard as well, who's been on so many of our programs over the years, talks about the lawyer personality and uh you know, the psychological, psychic aspects of, of, of life after law is, is um, really scary to a lot of lawyers, very emotional. Um, and more than any other profession, lawyers equate self-worth with their professional accomplishments. And when you're not that lion of the courtroom anymore and you're not the big poobah anymore, Life will be different. And as Don says, are, are you ready for that psychologically? Ida Abbott, uh, you'll meet her if you come to our fall symposium. And she writes a lot about this, you know, being ready for life after law and, and setting yourself up for that because it will be different. And a lot of firms, a lot of lawyers have trouble adjusting. Don, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Your participation throughout and these last few slides and so many things we could have talked about. One thing, you know, <laughs> I think we, we've hammered pretty good is start early, start earlier, have the conversations about, uh, about, about what people's plans are uh, beyond law and uh, get little plans in place, senior lawyer transition plans, something we've done work with. And, uh, but but it, sometimes it just doesn't happen naturally because you, you hope it will. Um, you know, do you, do you even care about the legacy of your firm? That's a fundamental question to ask. And most 
managing partners, I'm sure, Uri. Of course, I care about the legacy of my law firm, but you don't see them taking the actions to ensure the legacy of their law firm, the, the succession, the sharing, the pass along. So, um, you know, just scratching the surface, so many things we can talk about here. Uh, and we will be, be drilling down in more detail on November 3rd. Uh, so be sure to check us out. Um, Uri, anything you want to put out there before we part ways uh, this afternoon? Oh, and then I'll ask Don for his parting parting thoughts. Uh, there's so much on this list, John, that you just alluded to. I, I just want to highlight one point, which is uh, we talked about planning. Uh, we didn't talk much, and I know we will talk at the symposium about it, but it's creating a culture around a retirement culture of a next step culture. It's bringing that up institutionally. And uh, as I think Don said earlier, how do you talk institutionally at a law firm? Compensation. So we had some questions about compensation. I know you had it on the list. I know we'll drill down at the symposium and I just wanted to highlight that. You all know that at your firms, but, uh, and it was on the list, but you're gonna wrap it all together. Great job, guys. Well, you know, there's a, there's a lot to it. Start early, come up with a plan. Uh, you know, hopefully this has been helpful to you and we'll send some follow up material. And uh, Uri, thank you again for your uh, your duties uh, this afternoon. We always appreciate it. And Don, thank you for uh, being with us. We we very much appreciate it. And to our audience, thank you. We hope to see you live sometime soon. Bye, everybody. All Bye, right. John. Thank you.